internet and welcome to another episode of That's All I Have to Say About That Supreme Court Saturday. As always, I'm your host Stephen Mackey. Today we're talking about the case that was essentially the pinnacle of the civil rights movement for a new type of person, the corporation. Yes, we're talking today about 2009 Citizens United vs. Federal Election Committee, a case where the question of whether a private company can fund independent attack ads before a political campaign was discussed. Now, a lot of people think that this was the Supreme Court case that ruled corporations are humans, but that case was actually 1886's Santa Clara County vs. Southern Pacific Railroad when it was decided that the 14th Amendment rights applied to corporations. Wow, just about 20 years after we gave slaves those rights. So anyways, what happened? Well, let's go back to 2008. It's a one-sided and highly critical look at the life and politics of Hillary Clinton. She was the first first lady to come under criminal investigation. But very few people had even heard of Hillary the movie until last year when the U.S. government banned the film and its ads from airing on TV. Ah, 2008, a time when it was considered that Hillary Clinton could be a better competitor as Democratic nominee than Obama. Yeah, good luck with that one. So just before the Democratic primary, a nonprofit corporation, Citizens United, wanted to release a documentary and promotional materials about Hillary Clinton. And let me tell you, they knew how to sway Democrats. So you're telling me you made a documentary that has both Ann Coulter and Dick Morris in it? Well, what Democrat primary voter wouldn't be all ears? Anyways, just before airing the commercials for it on TV and airing it on demand, the Federal Election Committee stepped in, banned it, and got sued, at which time this was reported. The Federal Election Commission ruled that it constituted an ad and would violate established campaign finance laws, banning use of corporate funds advocating for or against a federal candidate. Citizens United argues that corporate speech is entitled to just as much protection under the First Amendment as individual speech. Now, before we go any further, just throughout this episode, remember how cut and dry the reporting made this case sound. Citizens United argues that corporations are entitled to free speech the same way individuals are, and the FEC is against that. Sounds simple enough. So this went to the Supreme Court, where it was left up to the judges to determine whether Hillary the movie could play on TV or not. Well, let's get started. Argument this morning in case 08205, Citizens United versus the Federal Election Com Commission. So first, we need to distinguish between two different campaign expenses, campaign contributions and campaign expenditures. Further, as of Justice Breyer's point, you have two cases, one in which an uh, office holder goes to a corporation and says, will you please give me money? They said, we can't do that. The other is in which a corporation takes out an ad for the for the uh, candidate, uh, which relieves that candidate of the responsibility of, of, of substantial television coverage. Isn't that about the same? Well, in the first place, if there's any coordination, and I, and, and I, and I think Buckley says no. Well, if Buckley says no, then I guess that takes care of that. So what is Buckley? Well, we need to travel back to 1971, when the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971 was passed. Now, this act did a whole bunch of important but irrelevant things, and for the sake of this conversation, it put limits to campaign contributions and independent expenditures. Now, this angered the ultra-rich because they wanted to have the ability to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to ensure that they could save millions on taxes. At which point, I gotta tell you, just chill. You're coming off as a little desperate. So then came Buck Buckley v. Vallejo in 1974, at which point it was argued that these campaign finance ceilings were limiting individuals' First Amendment rights. When this went to the court, the limits on campaign contributions to candidates were upheld, but the limits to individual expenditures were overturned, making it the first time the court recognized that campaign financing can be a free speech issue and the first time the court recognized the difference between campaign expenditures and campaign contributions. Going back to this case, this is an expenditure case that we're talking about right now, and not a contributions case, 
because the company that was producing these ads was on their own and not funding a politician or party to make them. Now, because this is a Supreme Court case, it has to deal with more subcategories than an OCD person's hard drive. So we have another legally distinguishing feature of this Hillary documentary. The possibility of finding a distinction between issue ads and candidate ads, the line dissolves on practical application. The interest of a... Where did we say that? You said that repeatedly, including most recently in the Wisconsin Right to Life case. Now to understand the case of Federal Election Committee versus Right to Life, we need to go back to the grand old year of 2002 when Congress passed the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. That's right kids, there was a time when Congress used to pass bipartisan acts. Now this act was ultra specific and banned corporations from spending more than $10,000 on issue ads within 30 days of a primary election and 60 days of a general election. These issue ads focus on specific issues, typically identifying a candidate's relationship with a specific issue, while not expressly advocating for or against the candidate. So it would be more like Hillary Clinton wants you to abort your ungrown babies, but if you're into that, vote for her, I guess. Just letting you know. Now, this Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act was contested by the Wisconsin's Right to Life group, which was a nonprofit that took corporate money who wanted to show their campaign ads within 60 days of a congressional election. And they won the case, setting precedent that unions and corporations can spend as much on political ads as they want at any point as long as they don't expressly advocate the, for the election or defeat of a candidate, in which case they could be constitutionally subject to limits and prohibitions on financing. Now this brings us to our final case that gets mentioned a lot in Citizens United. 1990s Austin vs. Michigan Chamber of Commerce. Robust debate about candidates for elective office is the most fundamental value protected by the First Amendment's guarantee of free speech. Yet that is precisely the dialogue that the government has prohibited if practiced by unions or corporations, any union or any corporation. The government claims it may do so based upon the Austin decision that corporate speech is by its nature corrosive and distorting. Now this decision was really the law of the land until, spoiler alert, the Citizens United case overturned it. The Michigan Campaign Finance Act banned corporations from spending their treasury money on independent expenditures to support or oppose candidates who were running for office in state elections citing the corrosive and distorting effect of immense aggregations of wealth that are accumulated with the help of corporate form. Wow guys, tell me what you really think. Not all corporate messages are bad though, I, I mean come on Supreme Court, join the conversation. Nope, never mind, they're terrible and more corrosive than Pepsi to teeth. So this limited corporations from private expenditures expressly designed to endorse a candidate. So now that we have some background, there was one issue that was surprisingly contentious in the Citizens United Supreme Court case. Why are we doing this? To the extent you've abandoned the original rationale in Austin and articulated different rationales, you have two, the quid pro quo corruption interest and the shareholder protection interest. Now I'm assuming that most of you are thinking, what? Isn't it obvious why you're banning corporations from engaging in financing independent election ads? It's the threat of quid pro quo corruption. Basically, you scratch my back and I scratch yours. Now this clearly makes logical sense, but this is politics. Show me the money. What is your answer to the argument that more than half the states, including uh, California and uh, Oregon, Virginia, Washington State, Delaware, Maryland, a great many others permit independent corporate expenditures for just these purposes. Now have they all been uh, overwhelmed by corruption? A lot of money is spent on elections in California. Has, is there a record that the corporations have corrupted the political process there? In quite a few states this corporate expenditure for politicians was already happening and it didn't really seem to have that large an impact on corruption. Although it's hard to prove this corruption because, for example, right to life advocates aren't going to launch a pro-liberal agnostic campaign and get him to flip his views on abortion. They're going to go with the Christian who already agrees with them. 
So when he does something that's consistent with his beliefs, it's not corruption. Although it was brought to our attention that... What about the district court's finding? Wasn't there a finding uh, before the three-judge court that federal officials know of and feel indebted to corporations or unions who finance ads urging their election or the defeat of their opponent. There was a finding of fact to that effect, was there not? The, the find, yes, I, uh, there is something to that effect in the district court opinion, but it doesn't cover all corporations. It didn't focus in specifically on So if they, did, if they just covered large corporations, so you take out the mom and pop single shareholder, well, that's 97% of the corporation. Not 97% of the contributions. Ooh, there's your classic Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Now there's your smoking gun though, right? I mean, you have a report saying that money from a corporation is making politicians friendly to those corporations. Checkmate. Well, no, because the report was researching contributions and not expenditures. Contributions are when you give to the campaign, while expenditures are when you make your own media independent of the campaign that happens to benefit the candidate. Now, while most people think that these are similar enough, they are two legally distinguishable concepts, so the results aren't as transferable as one would hope. So this led to the other argument for why corporations should be banned from spending money to independently promote candidates. The basis of two rationales that we have never accepted, shareholder protection and quid pro quo corruption. Most of you might think this is strange, but this was actually the more compelling of the two arguments. Leave it to America to hear about a potentially corrupting political system and think, oh, but what about the shareholders? The idea here is that, unlike a political party, a corporation is made up of shareholders with diverse points of view and agendas. For this reason, it makes sense for a corporation to want to advocate for a certain cause that will make it more money. But when it comes to a candidacy, a company is using the money of a shareholder to fund a candidate that maybe or maybe not he agrees with that could lead to some potential freedom of speech problems. Now, there was another sticking point in this issue as well. Mr. Olson, do you think that media corporations that are owned or principally owned by foreign shareholders have less First Amendment rights than other media corporations in the United States? I don't think so. Yes, us over at the Russia Today News would like to formally endorse Donald Trump for President of United States. Don't worry though, there's no evidence of foreign governments taking out attack ads within 30 days of the election though. Facebook cuts a deal with lawmakers to hand over ads bought by Russians to allegedly influence the 2016 election. Now, to be fair, those might not have been covered by Citizens United. More just showing that there's a desire there. So why would I say that we aren't sure whether they're covered or not? Well, for something with so many different subcategories to it, one question plagued the dis discussion. What are we even talking about? If you say you're not going to apply it to a book, what about a pamphlet? I think a pamphlet would be different. A pamphlet is pretty classic electioneering. So there, this is no attempt to say the 441B only applies to um, uh, video and not to print. Well, what it's if just... the particular what if the particular movie involved here had not been distributed by video on demand? Suppose that uh, people could view it for free on Netflix over the internet. Suppose that free DVDs were passed out. Suppose people could attend the movie for free in a movie theater. Suppose the exact text of this was distributed in a printed form. Now, in light of your retraction, I, I have no idea where the government would draw the line with respect to the medium uh, that could be uh, prohibited. Yes, well, n none of those things, again, are covered. No, but could they? Which of them could and which could not? I, I understand you to say books could not. Yes, I, I think w you, what we're saying is that um, there has never been an enforcement action for books. Nobody has ever suggested, nobody in Congress, nobody in the administrative 
apparatus has ever suggested that books pose any kind of corruption problem. Now, for the Federal Election Committee, one key piece missing from this argument is, if you're going to ban something, what are you banning? I mean, okay, books are safe to be released within 30 days of the election because no one's ever thought, darn that Obama, you know what I'm going to do? Crack open this 300-page book to legitimize my anger. That said, brochures, they're a no-go. Well, what about a kid's book then? Are documentaries okay? Nope. How about this clip that CBS paid to promote and release within 30 days of the presidential election? I'll keep you in suspense. Oh! Oh, suspense! <laughs> Democracy is going to end with a cliffhanger. <laughs> I guess, I guess we're all going to have to wait until November 9th to find out if we still have a country. If Donald Trump is in the mood for a peaceful transfer of power, or if he's just going to wipe his fat ass with the Constitution. Now, before we read too much into that, maybe he was talking about the issues when he said Donald Trump was going to wipe his fat ass with the Constitution, and not an attack denouncing the candidate. I mention that because similar to Hillary the movie, that was an advertised special event played on network television with ads going beforehand and advertised and put on demand. With this type of huge ambiguity as to what a corporation can and can't say, and where they can and can't say it, and why they can and can't say it, what are we even talking about? It was perfectly summed up in the closing arguments. My point is that the government here has an overbroad statute that covers every corporation, irrespective of what its stockholders think, irrespective of whether it's big, whether it's general, um, uh, a big railroad baron or anything like that. And it doesn't know, as it stands here today, two years after this movie was offered for, for, to the public for its view, what media might be covered, what type of corporation what might be covered, and what compelling ju uh, justification or narrow standard would be applied to this form of speech. So what happened? Well, I could only find one news source covering this ruling, and it was Keith Oberman just milking this thing for all it's got. First, he went on a long piece about slavery and the fight for humans to get rights, but then he finally got to the point. Today, the Supreme Court of Chief Justice John Roberts, in a decision that might actually have more dire implications than Dred Scott v. Sanford, declared that because of the alchemy of its 19th century predecessors in deciding that corporations had all the rights of people, any restrictions on how these corporate beings spend their money on political advertising are unconstitutional. In short, the First Amendment, free speech for persons, which went into effect in 1791, applies to corporations, which were not recognized as the equivalents of persons, until 1886. In short, there are now no checks on the ability of corporations or unions or other giant aggregations of power to decide our election. Yes, there are no longer any checks and balances to corporations determining our elections. Except voters? I unfortunately learned that when Trump beat Bush in the primaries. So yes, now corporations can buy ads in any form and advocate for candidates, although in many states that was already the case. So whether this is good or bad, it might have gotten slightly overblown. Anyways, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed that last video. For more episodes of Supreme Court Saturday, click here. Please like and subscribe by clicking here, and if you're really a fan, you can join our Facebook group. It's just a party over there.